Our next guest is one of the most prolific and exciting young composers working in opera today. He is a composer in residence at LA Opera. He is co-artistic director of the American Modern Opera Company. And according to the MacArthur Foundation, he is a legit genius. He is also the composer of Eurydice, which will premiere at the Met on November 23rd. That's not the first job he's had at the Met. Please give a warm Zoom welcome to Matthew. I'll coin Matthew, reveal yourself. Matthew, hi. We've never met before. I'm Susan Blackwell. It's so nice to meet you. Um, folks have introduced themselves throughout our day today. And so I'll just ask, would you care to share your pronouns and a little visual description of yourself? Uh, hello, can everyone hear me okay? We can hear you great. Nodding, great. Um, Susan, nice to nice to meet you and nice to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, visual description of myself. What do you mean by that, Susan? Well, let me, I'll do mine and then you can do yours. Okay, okay. so I'm a, I'm a white lady. I have sort of long silver hair. Uh, I'm wearing some uh, black eyeglasses and behind me is a blurry white curtain. That's how you do it. All right. Well, uh, uh, I guess I'm I'm uh, I'm at home in in Vermont. I divide my time between Vermont and and, and New York. Um, and uh, let's see. I'm a I'm a skinny dog loving uh, <laughs> guy with a with a beard <laughs> who likes to write operas for some bizarre reason. So that's that was I'm like a, a visual, visual description plus plus plus. That was great. Right. Well, I'm not a visual thinker, so I, I it actually had to really reach for it. You're doing okay. You're doing okay. It's only going to get weirder from here, Matt, because oh, I like to I like to kick it off with our guests with a little game that I call 60 second life story. I'm going to put 60 seconds on the clock and you get to tell us your whole life story. Don't leave out the awesome parts starting now. Oh, geez, no pressure. No pressure. Um, well, I was, I was born into a really loving, nurturing family outside of Boston. I grew up there, uh, caught the bug for, for music at a very early age and it sort of consumed, it's probably consumed more of my waking hours than any other um, activity. And uh, I guess I would then jump to about six years ago when I met my uh, husband, Clay, um, and sort of that changed my life from being this slightly monkish, austere, Spartan, solitary life into being a much warmer and more domestic one here in Vermont with, with him. So um, am I close to 60 seconds? That was Susan? beautiful. You have a full 10 seconds left, but that was well, a great life story. I haven't done anything else. <laughs> Is there a dog in that house in Vermont? You said you were a dog lover. Is there a dog there? There are, there are two dogs, but they're both out at the moment. Uh, would you mind sharing their names? I'm a real fan of dog names. Sure. What's, what there's, your do there's a there's Rosie, who's a, a medium sized hound mix, and there's Tico, who is a, a, a dachshund chihuahua corgi mix. You know, we didn't pick Tico's name, but um, his previous foster parents named him Taco, which we thought was a horrible name with all kinds of problematic overtones for a part chihuahua dog. So we changed the vowel from taco to tico. I'm a real fan of that dog blend, I have to say. We have two chihuahuas over here. Their names are Kitty Bunny and POTUS. Um, so from our household to yours, we say- POTUS our... like president of the United States or what? He's, he's our POTUS. So right. we always have a POTUS we love. Great. See how that works? That's okay. Right. Um, <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we started off this conference today by asking participants the following question. Is there a particular moment or chapter in your life that would make for a good operatic moment? And just to get your brain working, I know you're a deeply creative person, but just so you know some of the things that people shared, I shared that there was a there was this little chapter in my 20s where I was in love with two people at the same time. I think that's very operatic. Um, this is from Stephanie Holmes, uh, an educator, navigating a high school symphony through the bowels of JFA, JFK only to find Swiss Air gave away 10 of our plane seats, a very, opera worthy moment. Dr. Kamala Schelling shared adopting her cat, such a soprano personality. 
Dr. Schelling says. Are there any moments from your life that feel particularly opera worthy, Matt? Oh gosh. No, I don't think so. I mean, that's why I write them because I don't, I don't live them. <laughs> you bring that excitement in through your creativity. I'll take that. That moment that you described falling in love with clay seems like it might be opera worthy. I'll just, you can take that or leave that, but that seemed pretty opera worthy too. It seemed pretty well, sure. transformative. None of us, n neither of us have, uh, you know, uh, murdered the other or gone up in a blaze of Wagnerian fire or anything. So Yet. Thank Yet. goodness it felt super operatic. Again, you know, I tr Susan, I, tr I try to channel it into the music. There's nothing left for my life once I- It's so healthy. <laughs> what you're describing is so healthy, Matt. So Matt, I think you know this, but just in case you don't, present for this conversation is a community of educators who are instilling a love of opera in their students and their communities. You mentioned this in your 60 Second Life story, but can you tell us a little bit more about how you first came to love music? Sure. And, and uh, just to say to everyone here, uh, I am so glad to be in your presence and so grateful for the work you do because, you know, I, I should mention actually Clay is a music teacher um, for grades K through eight. Um, and so I, I have Come on. experience of, of, of witnessing that kind of instilling um, in action. And it is like the most beautiful thing in the world. So thanks for everything you do. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think I had a sort of, you know, road to Damascus or whatever you want to call it moment when I was six and, and just kind of heard Beethoven's Ninth playing somewhere. I don't know. I don't remember where it was. It could have been the radio, it could have been in a mall for all I, all I remember. But I just remember thinking sort of how, just sort of being dumbstruck, you know, how did this come to be? Um, and I think the rest of my life has sort of been a, an un furling of that of that question you know of of, of uh, the way that I sometimes put it is that music answered the question of whether life is worth living before I knew how to ask that question um and so Amazing. I I've, I've wanted to kind of share you know as as I think all of you do as teachers I've just wanted to help as many people have that experience as possible and you know you can do it through teaching or you can do it through performing music there's a million million roads the opera came a little bit later though. I remember when I was a, a very young kid thinking that operatic singing uh, sounded totally ridiculous. And I, I was sort of embarrassed for the singers because it. I, I remember thinking, oh gosh, they don't even seem to realize how stupid they sound. How embarrassing for them. Um, this, is, this is awful. Um, because they're sort of singing and they just, they, they sound totally unhinged. And I was just like, ooh, something's wrong here. Um, but the piece that the piece that changed that for me was was Mozart's Nozze di Figaro, Mar the Marriage of Figaro, um, which I think has I, I do think actually that for kids who are open to it, Figaro is an amazing sort of gateway drug to opera um, because it is it it, it is uh, it's it, it's such a human scale. You know, you, you, the character of Carabino in particular, I think, sort of reads as a as a mischievous 11 year old. I mean, he's older than 11, I think, but kids can relate to this, this character. Also, Carabino is a, is a deeply androgynous figure um, and someone who's sort of figuring out what's going on sexually. Mm. Um, and I remember coming across the piece uh, at a moment in my life when that was relevant um, and, and feeling like it was sort of speaking to me across the centuries. So yeah, that's that's a little bit. Th those are some early experiences that 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 made an an imprint. It's so interesting to hear you say that because earlier, before you came into the Zoom room, um, Dr. Naomi Andre was having this conversation with Terence Blanchard, and there was a very there's a theme forming here, which is these living composers talking about hearing opera at a young age and being like, oh boy. Oh boy. And then <laughs> as you, as you mature, um, uh, sort of falling in love and experiencing it in a different way, which I think is sort of news that we can use as educators who are, you know, taking, you know, trying to instill this love in our students and our communities. I think it's, um, I don't know, I think it's useful information to just take us back, remind us what it was like to experience those things when we were younger and how can we get to that place that you're talking about where 
something clicks, something becomes relatable and it, um, it, it feels like it's applicable to our own experiences. I absolutely agree. Uh, you know, it, it's so helpful to, to meet people where they are and, 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 and remember that, uh, this thing that we love, uh, maybe, oh, there's, there's one of the dogs. Um, hey Rosie, that sounds like a big, a bigger <laughs> Rosie. Uh, that this thing that we love might seem totally alien. And, and one thing I would sort of add to that is that for me, opera is so much about what the human body can do um, in person. You know, it, it's this kind of, especially operatic singing, it's this almost superhuman thing that, uh, that happens organically. It's this magnification of, 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 of the body. And you don't really feel that if you see it on TV or you hear a recording. It can sound ridiculous if it's in that context, but if you feel it up close, if you can feel your rib cage vibrating, um, you know that for me is is the kind of thing that there's no way to to not be affected. So yeah, it's like it's like being in the presence of a real life superhero. It's right. <laughs> kind of amazing. Um, so we have had the great good fortune today of learning so much about the source material. Dr. Mark Pottinger, uh, I think you came in on the tail end, was sort of giving us this amazing history of this source material. You actually, before composing the opera Eurydice, you ex have explored the source material before with your own work, The Orphic Moment. Can you help, help me understand um, the Orphic moment is the moment, right? When Orpheus does that thing that the one thing Orpheus wasn't supposed to do, turn back. Can you sort of explain what that means to you? What, just unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah, this is a great question. Cause I've had, I've had kind of a long journey with this. this you material. have, so, yeah. Um, you know, I think composers are obsessed with, with Orpheus and the Orpheus story because it is music's primal myth of self-glorification. It's the, it's the only myth that says that music can conquer death and can, you know, it, it's, it's good news if you're a musician, you know, of course you love this too. But the thing that I love about it is that it's not, you know, it's not a happy story. Basically what it says is music can conquer death, but humans will always screw it up. You know, we music is a human thing, and it's also uh. human. And in a way, we are not worthy of it. Um, and and that to me is what's so poignant about the figure of Orpheus, um, is that he's he has this kind of superhuman power, but he's also kind of a regular guy who's mopey and whiny and has all these unattractive qualities. And we we see him conquer death and then we see him lose it. And that to me feels so real because yeah, we, we humans can do extraordinary things and also we have these, these terrible impulses. Um, so my first kind of attempt to wrestle with this story, also I, I wanna repeat something that my teacher, Jory Graham, the poet said, which is that the, the really great myths kind of transcend the question of whether they happened or didn't happen because they are always happening inside mm. of us. And that to me is so real. Good stuff, um, yeah. This, you know, it captures something that's always happening in the human psyche. You know, we have been there. We've all been Orpheus. We've probably also been Eurydice. We've been betrayed in that way by someone and thought, why, why did they do that? It doesn't make sense. So to me, uh, it's not like it's some old Greek story. For me, it's so, permanently relevant because it's so deep inside the psyche of our, of our species. So my first attempt to, to, to engage with the story was this piece, as you said, the Orphic moment, which is like a 15 minute piece for a singer, a solo violinist and a small ensemble. And my idea with that piece was to kind of expand the couple of seconds before Orpheus turns around um, into a piece. And to sort of ask the question of what is really going through his mind? What really makes him turn around? And uh, in that piece, which I, I wrote the words for myself, you know, my answer was pretty dark. My answer was that uh, Orpheus turns around because he knows that loss is the most productive thing in the world for music. Oh. And 
I think there's this really dark thing happening in every version of the myth, which is that he's choosing basically between music and love, you know, between his art and his, his, the love of his life. And he chooses music. And I, I think that's really dark. And, you know, if you look at the shape of any great Orpheus opera, the Gluck or the Monteverdi, it has this really strange shape where Eurydice dies the first time and then Orpheus gets to sing all this beautiful music about that. And then he saves her, but immediately he, he's, he makes her die a second time. And then he gets to sing even more beautiful music. And that for me is why the Orpheus myth is like the essence of opera because it's death as an excuse for music making. Uh, I mean, that's the case in La Boheme too, but it's much more distilled and much more um, cruel in a way in the Orpheus myth. So anyway, that first piece was kind of an explosion of that moment. And I, I wanted to kind of psychoanalyze <laughs> those couple of seconds. Um, and then when I started talking to uh, Peter Gelb uh, at the Met about developing a new piece, I had just written the Orphic Moment and I thought, you know, there's a lot more to do here. I think I wanna expand this into a, into a full length opera. And then the funniest thing happened, which is that I got totally depressed about the idea of just wallowing in a male artist's narcissism for two and a half hours. I mean, yes, it's. I think what I did in Orphic Moment is a valid take on the myth, but the more that I thought about, am I really gonna do that for a whole evening? Am I really gonna just say, you know, he's a jerk um, and he's, you know, he's a narcissist and that's what art is? Like that just came to feel so depressing to me. And so I got stuck. And the thing that unstuck me was the recommendation that I should really talk to Sarah Rule, the playwright. Um, and that, that recommendation came from two trusted sources. One was my younger sister, Christine, who, who really knows the world of contemporary theater. Um, and the other was Andre Bishop, the artistic director of Lincoln Center Theater, uh, who have partnered with the Met to, to develop new pieces. So I checked out Sarah's play, Eurydice, and, you know, of course, I just like wept helplessly because it's, it's so beautiful. Um, and I found myself thinking, this is the answer. This is a yeah. take on a myth that is different from mine. It's, it's, it's not as dark. Uh, it's, it's, it's from the other end of the camera in a certain way. And then, you know, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to a couple of years into working on the piece. But what I came to realize near the end of composing Eurydice is that I actually don't think Eurydice is even really an Orpheus and Eurydice piece. I think it's actually a different story. Um, I think it's a meditation on uh, loss and mm. what you get to um, carry into the next life and what you don't, you know, what it means to lose mm. the ones you love. Um, it's an exploration of, of the father-daughter relationship um, so this is all to say, um, I'm really, really grateful to Sarah for both kind of expanding my sense of this story and also um, telling another story, you know, because really that's what she did in Eurydice is to tell another story that the Orpheus myth is kind of embedded within. So, uh, not to yeah. Not to oversimplify it, but I think it's so cool that both of you independently as artists were sort of exploring this and then uh, that, you know, your sister and, you know, <laughs> artistic leadership sort of had the presence of mind to kind of bring you all together to, uh, I don't know, to make a whole new thing out of it. I just think that's really great. What a, that's amazing. Love that. Um, you're working in this on this piece. You have worked and collaborated with two fellow MacArthur geniuses, Sarah Rule, who of course is the librettist, and director Mary Zimmerman, whom we've learned so much from previously at this very conference. Um, had you worked with either Sarah or Mary before this? I had not, um, but I knew both of their work, and, and I knew Mary's work in part through her. 
uh, Metamorphoses, her adaptation of of, of course, book, which includes the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. And one very cool thing about uh, the creative team on on this piece is that Sarah, when she wrote the play Eurydice, was partly inspired by having seen Mary's play Metamorphoses. And so basically Mary wrote Metamorphoses, Sarah wrote Eurydice, I wrote the opera of Eurydice, and now Mary is directing that. So talk about full, full, full circle and you know the generations talking to each other. It's really cool. <laughs> it's a little Avengers Unite. I mean, you and you had previously explored this through this the Orvic moment. So it's sort of it's so cool the way all those puzzle pieces sort of came together and hooked together. And that that is amazing. I just have to ask when you have three bona fide geniuses collaborating, like who gets the final vote in that room? <laughs> um, well, I think that's a question that applies uh, to any composer, librettist, director, team. And I think what I would say is uh, there's a division of labor that is really important. You know, it takes a village to make an opera. <laughs> and so, you know, it's important for us to have different domains. You know, I have the final say about the sounds. You know, I have the final say about what the harmonies are and 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 what the vocal lines are. Um, and Mary uh, has the final say about what the visual world of the piece is. Um, and of course, we we have a deeply collaborative relationship, and uh, we all offer ideas and 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 comments uh, about each other's work. But we have an understanding, you know, I think peace is kept <laughs> because we have an understanding that you know mary knows the 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 the, the visual and and uh, uh you know the world of action the world of what's happening between people on stage much better than i do and she knows that my domain is sound so you know uh, that's that's how we work it out got it everybody's in charge of their department that makes sense I understand that there are pieces of Sarah Rule's life that were the emotional kernels for her play Eurydice, the death of her father, an earlier relationship with a musician. Are there any kernels of your lived experience, and those could be large or very small, that are sort of embedded in this opera? That is a great question. Um, you know, my, my previous opera, was called Crossing, and it was about Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman's experiences in in, in the Civil War. And though, of course, I uh, I didn't live during the Civil War, and 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 my lived experience is deeply different from Walt Whitman's. Uh, I think there was a lot of me in that piece because I, I wrote the the words, and um, yeah, that one felt much closer to to home. In Eurydice, I think there are a couple of ghosts of it, though. Um, I started writing the piece around the time that I met my husband. And I think there's a sort of lightness to the early scenes, um, the, the, the early love scenes that I think have something to do with, with that experience. I called but it. Really, this is, I called it, yes. You, I, I could somehow, I could tell you did, Susan. Um, <laughs> but this is much more Sarah's piece. And, you know, I asked her um, how it, feels, you know, to see, um, you know, to see others engaging with these, these very raw personal experiences, the, the, the loss of her father. I mean, there are whole sections in the opera's last act um, uh, about, you know, directions to her father's childhood home. There's this incredibly moving sequence where as he's about to dip himself in the river, he narrates um, the directions to his, his childhood home and then imagine stepping into the river behind that mm. house. You know, it's really, it's, it's, it's personal stuff. Yeah. And, and Sarah said something beautiful, which is that it felt very raw to her around the time that she wrote the play because it was pretty soon after her father had passed that she started writing it. But that now it's been almost 20 years and she, she feels like it, doesn't belong to her anymore, that it's kind of, it's, it's, it's passed into this shared um, experience, yeah. um, which 
which I think is 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 beautiful. And you know, maybe I'm a little little too young to to have had that exact experience, but it's 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 moving that she feels like she's been able to give it away. Love that. Love that. Um, you do something that is so interesting in the piece that I think would be useful for the teachers to for us to unpack a little bit, which is the way that you represent the voices of deities or partial deities in Eurydice is really specific and interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so the relevant parts here are, are both Orpheus and uh, Hades, the lord of the, the underworld. And with Orpheus, you know, as I said a little earlier, um, he's got a split nature. He's got a split personality. Uh, he has this kind of superhuman gift, and also he's a normal dude <laughs> in a kind of frustrating way. And I wanted to embody that. I wanted to musicalize that. So I just thought, let's have two singers. Let's have him be two people. Um, and, and so that's, that's what it is. Um, there's a baritone Orpheus and there's a countertenor Orpheus. And the baritone Orpheus is Orpheus as a regular guy, Orpheus as um, a human. Uh, you know, the baritone is kind of a conventionally masculine, middle of the road, middle of the range, um, voice type. It's it's certainly the voice type of a normal dude. I think uh, if we had to if we had to pick one, um, and so uh, when Orpheus is in one of his more regular states, only the baritone sings, and Eurydice only ever sees the baritone. But when he goes into one of his musical trances, you know when this when this other power speaks through him, then the countertenor joins. And so it's kind of like a forked tongue of sound. We, we, mm. we hear the baritone and the countertenor um, sometimes split by more than an octave. Um, and you know, I wanted to create the sense that there is some part of Orpheus that Eurydice doesn't have access to. That's something that I felt strongly in, in Sarah's play is that Eurydice is always going, what are you thinking about? What, what's going on in your head? And, you know, I wanted to make that physical. There's a bit of, um, of, of T.S. Eliot's Wasteland that I love, you know, the, who is the third who always walks beside you? When I look ahead up the white road, there are only you and I together, but, you know, uh, but there seems to be this shadow. Anyway, so Orpheus is double, is the shadow. And then there's Hades, um, the Lord of the Underworld. So uh, I went kind of against the grain or against operatic convention with this role because, you know, operatic villains tend to be low voices <laughs> um, and certainly operatic devil figures, um, whether it's, uh, you know, Gounod's Mephistopheles or Berlioz's Mephistopheles or Boito's Mephistopheles, um, uh, they're almost always bases. Um, but Sarah's representation of Hades uh, didn't really feel like that to me. Sarah portrays Hades as a kind of shapeshifter. You know, we meet him first as this kind of seedy businessman, you know, he's sort of in a tattered coat and then he, you know, he brings Eurydice to his penthouse apartment and he puts on bad, you know, samba music on the radio. And, you know, he's just this sort of weird, scuzzy person. And then in the last scene, you know, we're told that he's like 10 feet tall. So he's, he's this shapeshifter. Um, and there's something really kind of absurd about him. You know, he, he, he sort of exists on the knife edge between being funny and terrifying. Um, so I thought, well, what's the right voice type for that? And I decided that he should be a very, very, very high tenor, um, like a freaky high tenor. His first note is the tenor's high B and he, he frequently sings high you know, Cs and, and D flats. Um, and so the effect that I wanted to create with that was that it's sort of like he's, uh, you know, he's on helium or something, but he has no idea 
how ridiculous he sounds. <laughs> he, he thinks he's talking normally, but but he sounds absurd to everyone else. That's great. I, I really feel like that's something that would be useful for the teachers to convey. Um, we actually have an educator who has a question. Andra, Andra, would you please come feature in the Zoom room? Can we get a spotlight? Hi. Hello. You've got you've got the best questions. What you got? What you got for Matt? Um, I have two questions, please. Uh, though I don't know, you might not want to share this first one. What ideas do you have for future operas in case you're a secretive person? <laughs> and then the second one is, do you have any dream collaborations that you are hopeful will happen in the future? So those are my oh, Those are great questions. Well, um, as long as you all don't, you know, post all these things on Twitter, I'm happy to share, you know, share a couple of, of ideas. I mean, I, I think I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about what are the the myths of our time. What are the because I think opera is at home in the world of myth because it's not a it's not realism. It, opera can never be realistic because everyone is singing. It's that simple. It's it, so it, it's it's most at home in the, the dreamlike and the surreal and the, the mythological. And I think the myth of our time or the, the story that is shaping our world now is the story of what's happening to the earth. You know, it's the story of climate change. And so, uh, I, you know, I'm just to be very clear by saying that it's the myth of our time, I'm not saying that climate change is a myth. Of course, it's very real, it's just that it's, it's rewiring the way that we think about world stories because, you know, for humans, nature has always been the thing that doesn't change. You know, we change, but nature is not supposed to change. And now nature is changing. And that is almost more than we can process. So I've been going back to some very old stories that to me feel like they're actually about what's happening to the planet, including this story that's present in both uh, uh, Norse and Indian mythologies about the snake that wraps around the oceans, wraps all the way around the world and sort of grows and grows and poisons the oceans and, and becomes too big. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested in, in going there. It would be fairly epic, <laughs> fairly, you know, Wagnerian. Um, and, you know, one person who I, I would absolutely love to work with, and I think he does have a, something of an interest in opera, um, is the the film director Guillermo del Toro, who I think is wow. just one of the great imaginative geniuses of our time. Uh, and in a way, his films are operatic, I think, in, in, in the way that they magnify fairy tales. So if I can ever convince Guillermo del Toro to direct a monster opera about the serpent wrapping around the planet, you know, I will, I think I'll consider my life's work done. <laughs> Andra, those were great questions. Thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. I'm sensitive to your time, Matt. So I think maybe we'll conclude with this question uh, from one of our educators. What would you like high school students to take away from your opera, Eurydice? Mm. And by the way, I, I do have a few more minutes if you if, if you have another question oh, or two. Great, great, great. It's okay, I have a hard cut off. Um, gosh, I, you know, to take away, I'm always kind of wary of, of answering this question, you know, because I don't I don't think works of art should be too prescriptive, you know. I I don't I don't there's not a moral, <laughs> there's, not a, there's not a particular message. Um, and if there were a message, it would be a fairly bleak one about everyone's memories being erased and loss and, and tragedy. So I, I, I hope that the students, you know, absorb something about, this is gonna sound uh, grandiloquent or, or something, but you know, something about love, something about different kinds of love um, romantic love, parental love, um, love of, of books, love of ideas. That's a huge part of Eurydice's character. Um, but what exactly it is that they take away or absorb, I, I don't know. You know, in a way I'm the last person to ask. I'm, I'm so deep inside the piece that I don't really know what the impact is on other people. So I just hope they enjoy it. 
I think that's a very fair answer. Very fair. Um, this is something that I do think that the teachers might enjoy hearing. Could you tell us a bit about your first gig working at the Met? Sure. So when I was a senior in college, um, I was uh, conducting an opera in, in the dining hall. Uh, you know, we just threw up some, threw up a stage and moved a bunch of chairs and had a little orchestra and, and uh, anyway, um, th the mother of, of one of the orchestra members came up to me after a performance um, and said, I really enjoyed it. You know, I think you should be working at the Met. And, you know, I sort of said, yeah, you know, me too, lady, wouldn't that be nice? You know, it was sort of my, that was my gut reaction. But she was like, no, no, I, I work there and I can, I can make some introductions. And it turned out she was indeed uh, an administrator at the Met. And it turned out that the company was in need of a, a member of the music staff, you know, someone who would work as an assistant conductor and a pianist and a coach. Um, because the, next, the following season, um, the company was doing uh, Thomas Addis's opera, The Tempest, which some of you may remember from, gosh, nine years ago at this point. And um, frankly, I, th <laughs> I think that a lot of the members of the music staff uh, were not in the mood to learn a brand new piece, you know, because they basically had the choice between doing Traviata again or spending their entire summer learning this incredibly difficult opera. So there was room for, for, <laughs> for a new kid who was- who Make was Matt to do it. it. Exactly. Uh, you know, and, and I, I love Thomas Addis's music. Uh, so uh, I auditioned and, you know, found myself uh, with a gig at the Met two months out of college. Um, it was an unbelievable um, experience. And wow. I, I learned so much from the singers, from my fellow, you know, music staff members, uh, just really the whole the whole company. And one thing just, you know, for, for folks who, who haven't been in the, the bowels of the building, um, it is an extraordinary atmosphere because there are people who do all kinds of things. You know, there are technical workers, stage hands, uh, people doing this incredibly virtuosic mechanical work in addition to the, the singing and the playing. Um, and so it's this very, it feels very democratic and very friendly and, and, and very um, diverse in, in, in a lot of different senses when you're actually in the building. So it was, it was a cool experience. Wow. That is, that's, that's some great, that's a, that's a great story. That is a really, really good story. Matthew, we're nearing the end of our time with you. Is there anything else that you would like to share with this gathering of educators, music lovers, and opera supporters before you go? Oh gosh, well, I just want to thank you all for 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 taking the time. Um, it it means a lot uh, as a as a composer um, to to have this kind of care um, being paid to to a new work. Um, I would just, I would honestly just say, uh, I can put my email in the chat if people want to follow up with individual questions, you know, I'm, or, or if you, if you want, you know, your students to ask questions, uh, I'm, I'll, I'm glad to make myself available. Um, and if I may say one sort of shameless plug, um, I have written a book about opera um, called The Impossible Art Adventures in Opera. Um, and it's, it's being published in early December. Um, and it is pre-orderable now. It's a series of essays about favorite pieces from throughout operatic history. So I would, I would be a bad author if I didn't mention that. <laughs> Congratulations on your book. Thank you. Congratulations on Eurydice. You are one of those people that just gets a lot done. Just a lot, a lot gets done at your house in Vermont um, with Rosie and Tico and Clay. Uh, thank you so much for generously offering to be in touch with these educators. And thank you so much on behalf of everyone present and the Met Ed team. Thank you so much for generously sharing your time with us and your thoughts. It really is. It is a treat. Thank you so much, Matthew. It has been such a pleasure. Thanks to you all.